Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're glad to be joined today by Roy Lilly from the Academy of Fab Stuff. Roy, um, you've been working in the NHS for uh, a long, a long time. This is our national health service, but you, you um, specialise in doing motivational stuff, and, and you were brought to my attention by a former guest on Access Chat, Igna Rip, who um, we absolutely love for his positivity and flamingo shirts and pink socks and the whole <laughs> nine yards that uh, that he brings to to the equation. He was, over, a he was over here recently. He was over here recently for a long weekend, and it felt like a fortnight. I was exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> He's a I great bet. guy. He's a it great must have guy. been fun. It must have been fun. We love Igner. Yes, yeah, I, I think if we could if we could bottle him, we could sell a sell yes. a lot of bottles. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a pink yeah. lotion. Yeah, it would do well kind. in the U.S. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it would do very well in the U.S. right now. <laughs> I think he'd be like a Pepto Bismol color, though. Definitely be <laughs> Pepto Bismol color. Um, so, so Roy. Um, Going went slightly off topic there. So the, the, tell us a bit about the how you came to to create the Academy of Fab Stuff and, and, and what you're doing with it. Well, um, here's here's the story. The full story is that I was at a conference one day, and um, in the news on that morning came the very unwelcome news that a hospital uh, had found itself in a real mess. Um, in the UK, we have uh, targets for just about everything. We've got more targets than a fairground. But the, the one of the targets that we have is the uh, is the target to give people with cancer chemotherapy in certain windows. Uh, it emerged that uh, three patients hadn't been given uh, those uh, those treatments within that window in that in that time, and they've died. Now we didn't know whether they died because they were very sick and would have died anyway, or they died because they didn't get the chemotherapy anyway. The police were called. Uh, the chairman of the uh, of the hospital stood down. The chief executive left, and it was a shame. He was a good guy. He was a doctor. He was uh, responsible, of course, not culpable, but responsible. And I I, I couldn't figure out why it was that good honest people working in our health service with a strong sense of vocation professional qualifications <clears throat> had got themselves into such a mess and uh, what, what had happened was they had falsified the documentation they had pretended the patients uh, had had the treatment so what had turned these good people into liars well the system had because here we have a a, a way of regulating our hospitals called inspection a very old-fashioned idea. It's been denounced by most uh, management gurus. It's been abandoned pretty well in every industry, but the NHS still does inspection. Now, this hospital was inspect was expecting to be inspected, and the managers at the hospital thought they were doing everybody a favour by fiddling the documentation. So when they were inspected, the fact that they hadn't given these appropriate treatments on time wouldn't emerge. Well, they got discovered. And and I stood on the stage, you know, almost uh, at my exasperated wit's end. Said, "This is ridiculous. We can't do this to people. We're turning them into crooks. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we had, oh, I don't know, the Academy of Fabulous Stuff, where people could ring up and say we've got problems with our chemotherapy targets? Does anybody have any ideas on how to fix it?" And someone would spin a Rolodex somewhere or look in a file and say, yeah, there are three hospitals here that have had problems. Here's their phone number. Give them a call and see if they can help you. Wouldn't that be a great idea? And I kind of said it in a, in a lighthearted way. But anyway, the upshot was when I got off the stage, a guy came up to me and said, that's a good idea. You should do that. I said, what? He said, the, the Academy of Fabulous Stuff is a great name. You should do it. So I did. Um, I uh, found some people to help me. Uh, I invested in the servers and the website. And here we are four years later with three million page views a year, 2,000 page views a day on some days. Uh, we're just about to start in Australia. Um, we'll be in Canada next year. We've got interest from right across Europe. And the whole idea is that it's based on the management theory of positive deviance. It works like this. All organizations perform around a mean. 
you get negative deviance where things go wrong at the bottom and positive deviance where things go right at the top. The negative deviance is what we focus on. Everybody focuses on what went wrong, who did it, who's responsible, who can we blame? Well, what's called positive deviance, and we find people who are in the same boat as everybody else. No one's got any more money than anybody else. Everybody's got too many patients. But we find the people who find the solution. We then share the solution. And we say, no, there's no such thing as a little thing. Everything's a big thing to somebody. And if you show people what good looks like, they'll get on, they'll do it better. That's our philosophy. That's the history. And that's how it works. Great. Um, and actually, we've been running for a similar length of time. Access Jet's been going four years as well. We just celebrated our fourth birthday. Um, and our outlook is very similar because we work in a profession in accessibility which is quite finger pointy. Um, so we, we don't have CQC, but we do have a lot of people that like to point the finger and tell you you're doing stuff wrong rather than um, highlight all of the wonderful stuff that organizations are doing. So a lot of companies were very afraid to talk about the work that they were doing to be inclusive um, or to find solutions for people with disabilities because they were afraid that someone would turn around and say, yes, but you're still not doing enough. So, so we took a conscious decision to try and focus on the positive. So it's uh, it's it's great to have someone else here that is 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 also focused on positivity. I know that um, Antonio has a question, so I'll uh, I'll hand over. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Neil. So, uh, so uh, by by looking at uh, uh, that f from a, a a positive perspective, do you think you end up with more people? You no. Know, Talking about this, uh, talking about it, and and asking for help, and also trying to find ways to to improve uh, the way how they were working. I, I think we do. I mean, we have now established 150 ambassadors who who work in the NHS. They're doctors, they're nurses, they're managers, and they become our ambassadors. They give us their time, and they encourage people to share what we call share the good stuff, to share their best practice. We have meetings with them. We have an annual conference. We've just had uh, our big awards. We have an awards uh, ceremony every year. And w w what I find is, I mean, I, look, you have to find the fulcrum point, and then you find the lever. And sometimes you need a very long lever to, to lever the fulcrum point. But our fulcrum point is the belief that people will do good stuff if you just give them the opportunity. The great thing is if you create the time and space for good people to do great things, they'll deliver. And that's the trick of leadership. There are two tricks in leadership. Create the time and space for good people to do great things and always hire people better than you. Those are the two things. And and, and that's what we, we aim to do with the academy. And yes, I think we do. I mean, we get inquiries all the time now from people. I mean, we've had a big problem here with um, uh, people coming into hospital through our accident emergencies we uh, systems it's been chock a block very very full and we now promoted an organization called ESIS, which is the emergency services collaborative they went from uh, a couple of page views on the department of health website to to thousands of, uh, uh, of views and now they run their own conferences and do their own stuff we don't take credit for what they do but we do take credit for the fact that we made it available and people can search and check the, the, the pages work just like a Facebook page. You can upload your good stuff and you can search for things as well. So it's it's a really straightforward thing. And, and I think from the numbers that I look at, we are gathering traction with people saying, do you know what? We're not going to reinvent the wheel. Let's find out what other people are doing. So I think we are, yes. And, and by doing that, do you believe that you also contributed to the well-being of all the stakeholders? Well, we like to think so. We've created a community. We actually call ourselves a social movement now. Uh, it's a huge community. We it's run uh, on a private Facebook page, uh, 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 and the the people on the Facebook page just do themselves. They do it themselves. They meet themselves. They meet up for drinks. They take their kids out together. They go shopping together. Uh, they meet at conferences. We do regional events, and so we've created a kind of social movement of people who share our view of life. 
that there's always somebody with a solution. You just have to find the person. And we try to make it easier to find. And I think, you know, we do have a very good spirit. We have another thing called the Academy Roadshow that we take to hospitals where we have some fun in the hospitals. We get, and this is interesting, we get the departments to showcase their good stuff from one department to the next. Because quite often in these big hospitals, one bit of the hospital doesn't know the good stuff the other bit's doing. And, you know, we've had instances where people have come up to us and said, you know, we never realised we were such a fantastic place that we kind of introduced the hospital to its, to itself. And um, that's, uh, so I think, I think the answer is yes, I think we do. Uh, we do help take the pressures off. Roy, I, I, I find this um, very interesting in a lot of ways. But my daughter, I have a 31-year-old daughter who was born with Down syndrome, and she she also has very, I don't think it has anything to do with the syndrome, but she's a very small woman. She's Her veins are small, or everything is small on her. And she, unfortunately, was just had, um, she was in the hospital here in the United States. And we often talk about how terrible healthcare is in the United States. They're terrible, they're terrible. But we had such a beautiful experience, and it was it was a really scary situation. Um, she almost died a few times. She needed emergency surgery. It was really, really, really scary. But what I saw these professionals coming together, these nurses, doctors, technicians, administrators, to really, really work with us as a team was really beautiful. And as you said, Roy, sometimes just the little touches, it, it's it's it is so, so huge. And one day, my daughter was going down to get a CT scan, and we knew that she needed emergency surgery. We were all freaked out. She went to the CT scan. When she came back, the nurses and the technicians had all decorated her room with princess theme. They had tiaras and, and boas and um, crowns and all of the nurses, and everybody was waiting for her. And some of the other patients got involved. It was so beautiful it just yeah. i'll cry thinking about it but and then they started talking about some other things they're doing and we often forget that there's so much beauty happening in these hospitals these people give their lives to us i they just they, my mother passed away uh, the very last day of the year last year it's been an intense period and the people that showed up the emergency people to help me when my mother was in trouble, to think that we can just call and these amazing people rush to us to help. These hospitals surround us with love. It's really beautiful. And I would be, so I love, love, love what you're doing. And I'm wondering, how does the United States get involved? Because do you look at it and say, well, the United States is doing it differently because the way we, you know, we're not, you know, we're fighting over uh, who gets coverage and all that mess, but um, it's not socialized per se, but in mm. some ways it sort no, of no, is. We, but... we're, we're not worried about that. Uh, in fact, um, we, we have quite a lot of uh, shares with the Cleveland Clinic um, okay, uh, who uh, often uh, browse our website and pinch our ideas with pride and, and they give us ideas as well. So no, absolutely not. And we would love to have a relationship uh, in the U.S. I mean, the the problem with the NHS with the the U.S. I want to do it. Yeah, okay, right. That's a deal. Let me help. Gotta, let's get our NIH involved too. Yes, let's get our NIH involved too. Yeah, I, I I mean, I'd I'd love to do it. The difficulty from us, our point of view, is that it's a disaggregated market. And like, where do you start? Right. You need somebody there who knows the way around. So if you can help us do that, I'll be on the first plane I'm right in. over, and we'll. We'll I'm get in. you. Yeah. And and we worked with we went to I'm gonna give a shout out. Henrico um, Doctors Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, which is part of HCA. HCA has three hundred hospitals all over the United States and in the UK. Yeah. And so well, look, okay, I well, look, say yeah, let's get the it, HCA involved. Yeah. Well the benefit of this kind of thing is that we talk to each other and we make contacts and then we can share we can share our good stuff as well. Because you right. know there's good right. stuff going on everywhere, so I, I'd be very anxious to do that. And what you say about the staff is so important. We we featured uh, just recently a lot of end of life care, which is very difficult. Yes. Um, and we've got some fantastic examples of end of life care and and how it's small things. Just give you 
uh, a little example. They, one of the hospitals asked men to donate their ties, and they cut the ties off, and they stitched up the bottom, folded the pointy bit over, put a button on it, and then when someone dies, when you give them back their jewellery, it's put in this little, this little rather nice little tie, you know, instead of just putting it in a box or wrapping it in tissue. So, I mean, it's the, it's the small, absolutely small things. And we had a, an, an incident where uh, one of the nurses, uh, there was a, uh, a girl having chemotherapy. One of the problems with chemotherapy is you get mouth ulcers and it's a very uh, uncomfortable thing. And the nurse went and got, uh, went down to the canteen and brought an ice lolly and brought it back and just said, you know, try that. And, you know, an ice lolly, you know, in our money, it's like, you know, less than a pound. Um, and uh, it, 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 it was such a, it was such a big thing. There is no such yes. thing as a small thing because the small things are the big things to somebody somewhere. And we major on that. I mean, I wouldn't want you to think that we don't do. I mean, we do do big strategic stuff as well. And we do do stuff around uh, flow and dynamics and, and uh, uh, surgical procedures and all that kind of stuff. But we, we absolutely get the fact that it's the little things. And I tell you, I've been in the NHS a long time. I've been in the NHS about um, over 40 years, I think. You know, I used to come to work with Florence Nightingale on, on a bicycle. You know, <laughs> uh, but I realized it was only in the last four or five years that I realized I've wasted my career, completely wasted my career, because I used to think you could change things from the top down. Yeah, you can make a plan and some give it to people and they go and do it, and deliver it. And, like, and, it, and I see major reorganizations and I've been involved in all these major organizations. And I never asked myself, why do we have to keep reorganizing things? Because it doesn't work. Top down doesn't work. But what we've learned is that ground up works. It's good yes, roots yes. make tall trees. And that's the how you do change. People love change if they think they're in charge. You know, it's, it's very simple. And so we we do a lot around change management. Yeah, yeah. And Tony just put in our in our chat window about the the concept of change agents, and and this is something that we talked with with Dr. David Bray and and Vince Cerf. So uh, slightly different um, industry, um, but but there there again, you know, he was the the CIO of um, of the Federal Communications Commission. Yeah. And, and but, the, but the principles are the same. Principles are absolutely the same. Yes. yes, people will do change if they're involved, but they don't like change right. done to them. No, no, absolutely. Right. And, it's, and not, so, it's not rocket science. No voice. Science. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Right. Absolutely. So you, what you want is pull change where people are are, are, yeah. are willing, not push. And, 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 and it's simple. Yeah. yeah you, you just you, if you want to change something, you figure out what it is, what you're doing. Decide yeah. if it's what you want to do. Put things in place to make sure you've got it all the time, every time, until you don't want it anymore. Four simple steps that you can involve everyone in. And then, you okay. know, you just go to places and say, okay, uh, what needs to be changed here that we can do with the petty cash? And people will give you 10 ideas. That's uh, what I yeah, Ideas, and they, the little things can can be su such game changers. And like yeah. you said, it's it's about the big things too. Yeah. Go ahead, Neil, but it, it's, it's- Sorry, Neil, it's, we've hijacked it. No, it's humanizing, no, no, that's okay. humanizing the health yeah, and, and, no, and sometimes it's best, you know, everyone uh, from sometimes from management perspective, everybody uh, is basically connected with their peers and sees things from a very horizontal way. And you really need to know how your, the dynamics of your organization how people work. You need to, if you know your organization really, really well, you'll be in a great position to empower change agents. Yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah, no, I think I think that's fair. And and really, the you know the stuff that you've been doing in the last four years is the getting out of the way bit of managing, yeah. which is the most important bit of managing. Is you, yeah, know, you facilitate and you get out of the way. We, yeah, we've created the time and space, and people have gone on and and they've done it. You know, so sorry, yeah. that's my phone. I yeah. Busy uh, so well, yeah. So um, you've also it's social change. Social yeah. change, you've, which is so important. You also do, you know, a lot of communicating because you've got an email letter uh, that goes out to what it's three hundred thousand people a day or something. Well, I don't know. How, to be honest, I don't know anymore. Um, uh, it, we have a huge mailing list, and we certainly yeah. get into a hundred thousand inboxes in the UK every week. And then it gets shared wow. around social media and so on. So we did have someone look at our footprint, and they thought it was about three hundred thousand. 
Wow, that's 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 huge for for something regular and 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 um, I you know I read up about it and and you said you know people used to to take the mick out of your poor spelling and and, yeah. and stuff like that because um, <laughs> you know like like me you're, you're you're dyslexic but actually it's the message that that counts but you know uh, and, and and maybe it's the fact that you are dyslexic that has caused you to take this different view and this different path. What, well, what do you, you know, say about that? It, it, it's interesting. I, I, I had a very bad time at school uh, and I was very good at sports. So I, I survived on the fact that I could, you know, be in a team and help win something or, you know, bring trophies back and schools like the trophy cabinet filled with yes. stuff. But I wasn't, I was horrible, really. I was a horrible kid. I was disruptive. I mean, my hobby now is painting, uh, but I got thrown out of the art class for being disruptive. Uh, and my my English teacher said I would never write anything more than a than a laundry list, and and I would probably be unable to spell most of the words on the list. And I and it was true. And I I used to hide the fact I couldn't spell. I I I just had great difficulty in learning. I had a lot of common sense because I got that from my mum and dad. You are what's in your genes. Uh, but I had a bad time. And it wasn't until later. Uh, I mean, I think if I'd have, uh, because I was the son of a window cleaner and I went to an ordinary school, I was regarded as disruptive and just they just wrote me off academically. If I'd have been the son of a lord, and gone to a public school, they probably would have said, why is this boy so stupid? And figured out the fact that I was dyslexic. Now, I, where I came from, we didn't know what dyslexia was. And it's only really in recent years that dyslexia has come to the fore. And, and you know, if, if these things can ever, can ever be called fashionable, it became fashionable. I mean, it's been a damn yeah. nuisance in my life, but, you know, people were prepared to talk about it. And I made a movie about it. Um, and and I said, look, I, you know, actually, what I actually said on the movie was, I'm dyslexic and I don't give a stuff, and and I do I do write regularly. I've written for all of the national newspapers. I've written 27 books. I'm just writing a book now on bereavement, man. and and I write almost every day for a huge audience in the NHS. And I know I get my spelling wrong, and I know I get typos, and I can't see them. I've tried everything. You know yourself. I tried the, I've tried the blue glasses. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. supposed to help. It yeah. doesn't. The spell checker helps. Uh, and now, I, I mean, I think people have, have, they have a bet to see how many typos I'm going to have in the week. But I don't give a stuff. People write to me and say, do you know, in the third paragraph of today's e-letter, there's a howler of a spelling. And I say, look, I write 700 words every day. The other 699 are OK. You know, I got one wrong. Get over it. So I'm really quite, I'm quite in your face about it. I don't care. And, I, and, you know, it's difficult for kids at school. Uh, but I don't think, you know, we want to drive them inwards, which is what happened to me. I think you, you have to say, look, this is what I am. This is what I can do. Measure me. Look at me. Calibrate me for what I can do, not what I can't do. And I think I'm a pretty good writer. I think I can do interesting things with uh, with uh, the written word, and and I do. And I think it's what's inside you that really counts. And so that's what I do every day. And if people don't like my spelling, well, then don't read it. I agree. That's, 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 and also, that's, cool. what if you're not broken at all? Same way with Neil. What if you aren't, this is just the way your brain works and your brain is more innovative. So what if instead of assuming you're broken and you're a bad disruptive kid and Neil's a bad kid because he has sort of a similar story and then it starts multiplying out and instead, who is Roy? Okay, Roy's a talented sports. He's, he is an innovative writer. I, we've got to stop this, you're bad because. Yeah. And I think that is the opportunity we have. And Neil, I know you want to comment on that too. Oh, I'm I'm bad for a multitude of reasons, but it's not my dyslexia. Um, and and like you, I I didn't get diagnosed until I was in adulthood. So I was a dilettante, I you know, a, a window gazer, lazy, you name it. Exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, so and um. I, I yeah to a certain extent I I actually did 
um, live up to some of those expectations. But the one well, thing I tell you, I, I tell I, you, you talked about yeah. being you talked about being diagnosed. I, I, mm -hmm. I was uh, I mean, th this was went right through my life. Mm -hmm. uh, until um, 20 years ago, so I'm 73 now. So this was yeah. 20 from 73. Um, I, I, I was a counsellor. I was a, a, a counsellor and the leader of the council and the mayor where I lived in Surrey in England. And I also became a governor of a school. And I was talking to the headmistress one day, and I was talking about school and experiences at school, and all I said, and she said, Roy, she said you're dyslexic. I said, how do you know? She said, I just know. So I did a test. That, and you've probably done the same rather peculiar mm -hmm. test. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's, I did, so I didn't get sorted out until I was, you know, it was far too late. Uh, and since then, you know, I've, I've set up a university uh, department for the health services management. I've been a visiting fellow at Imperial College. You know, it, I've been lucky in that it's not stopped me doing anything, but not everybody's as lucky, and some people do need a lot of help and encouragement. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because I I did get diagnosed later in life, but I I and it came about because I ended up working for a technology company that provided tech for people with dyslexia. Um, it ended up there because it ran in the family, but I was in complete denial. Um, but one of the things that we saw was that a high proportion of the people that we were providing kit to were nurses. Because what had happened is that, that um, now there's a requirement for nurses to, to gain degrees. And it was much more of a vocational um, type of job previously. And now there's a lot more written work. So people were that are naturally drawn to nursing there seems to be a, a fairly high proportion of people with dyslexia in, in, in the caring profession. So I don't know whether there's some kind of link between dyslexia and empathy, um, but, but we, we saw this a lot. We were, we were providing a lot of um, support for, for people in the nursing profession um, that, that just wasn't there before. And, and, and sometimes I think the over um, over strong focus on academic qualifications is getting in the way of people being able to just get on and do stuff. Um, yes, and it's yeah. you know it's it's the way we we get in the way as well. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I like to think that uh, things are getting easier and they're getting better. Um, I've I spoke at a school uh, to some youngsters, and actually the school were pretty receptive and. Um, they were doing the best they could. Uh, but look, you know, it's easy for me. I'm Roy Lilly. I'm kind of do what I do. And, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm not that bothered. But if you're young and, and you're impressionable, and you're trying to find your way in life and you want to be successful and all that, and you're very conscious, then, then it can be a big inhibitor. So all we can do is just encourage people. Yeah. So if you're not careful, you'll end up like Roy Lilly. Good That's word. not good. <laughs> So we, 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 I think there's also, um, well, we, we see this because we do quite a lot of work um, also with um, the Ministry of Justice. So we see um, we see that um, people with dyslexia are, are generally very innovative, but also, unfortunately, innovative on the wrong side of the law. So you see uh, quite a lot of people um, who are dyslexic or neurodiverse um, in the justice well, system. So, so it's something I that mean, we... we it, it, this, this is, I mean, this is so much about happenstance and, yeah. you know, what your life's chances are. I mean, people yeah, want absolutely. three things. People yeah. want three things. They, they want a safe place to live. They want a job and someone to love. Those three things, anywhere in the world, it works. Uh, and and that's, that's, you know, that's what we, we must do as community leaders and people who've got uh, influence and so on. We need to remember those three things. I mean, no kid is born bad. No, they're just no. born into bad circumstances, and it's us. It's up to us to, to sort that out. Yeah. Um, and in and the UK, you know, we've got a much higher levels of poverty than we can be proud of, and there's a there's a lot going on in, in our com in our communities. It's a big responsibility on all of us to do what we can. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. No one's no one's born bad. We make bad choices. 
sometimes and, and we certainly have you know we're dependent on our circumstances as you as you said so uh, thank you very much for for taking the time today we've we've come to the end of our half hour i need to thank uh, our supporters um barclays and my clear text for keeping the lights on for us um and doing the captioning so that we can be accessible um thank you roy um we look forward to uh, having a good discussion on twitter it's Thank been a great you, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm coming to America. <laughs> yes, don't worry, Roy. Uh, I'm yeah. going to be emailing you right after this. So, yeah. yeah. yeah so. Okay. I think but, listen, thank you. Thank you, the three of you, accident. for the opportunity. The half an hour has just flown by. And thank you yeah. very much. Yes. Bless you both. Thank, Bless you. You. thank you so much. Thank Roy. you. Thank you.